Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is someone who I've been trying to get on the program for a, quite a while. She's been a bit hesitant, but finally she said, all right. And we'll talk a little bit why the hesitation, maybe. But she's also, in some ways, an answer to some of your emails. Because some of you have been sending me emails saying, you're always having these husbands on the program. When are we going to hear from the wives? And so we have a wife's journey this evening, Mrs. Loveless Howard. I look forward to having Loveless on the program. The very first guest on the Journey Home program was Tom Howard and his journey. And Loveless is here this evening to share her journey into the Catholic Church, which was delayed about 10 years after Tom's. We'll talk about that. <laughs> What's the theme tonight? Well, the, the technical theme is a wife's journey, but we'll talk about a number of the issues that were important to her on her journey into the Catholic faith. Remember, you're an important part of this program, so if you'd like to send us a question, Call us at 1-800-221-9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Loveless, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you. Been wanting to have you on for a long time. <laughs> it's great to have you at EWTN, but there's another unique reason that you're here, right? I grew up here. This <laughs> right is my here. hometown. <laughs> In Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Are all the old buddies watching? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they might be. At least maybe they'll see the reruns when right, they hear you Right, on. right. But it's been a while since you lived here, is that right? Yes, it has. Okay, mm -hmm. that was your childhood. And, mm -hmm. well, we're going to talk a little bit about your journey tonight, along with reminding the audience of your husband, Tom's journey. Yes. But it's always good to, to start with the background. So why don't you share a little bit of your early okay. spiritual journey? I had a wonderful evangelical upbringing, which I think, gave me, best of all, a love for the Bible. From my childhood, I loved to read the Bible and read it every day by myself from when I was 11 years old. I also learned in my childhood to, and my youth to know God as my loving and faithful Father. I spent my college years, it sounds very old-fashioned, but reading the scripture and talking with my friends. And John 13 to 17 was my favorite part of the Bible. And I longed for that oneness with God, that the relationship between the Son and the Father, little knowing that the Catechism of the Catholic Church starts out describing this as the purpose of our life, that we were made to share the life of the Holy Trinity in glory forever. But that was the longing and desire of my young heart. Um, but I didn't know anything about the church growing up. That wasn't an important. We went to church on Sunday, but it wasn't church important. Church in general. Church. It was the invisible church all the way. Um, then when I was 25 to 30, I was in Japan as a missionary um, with a wonderful interdenominational evangelical um, international mission board. And I think it was in those years that I learned to appreciate the um, local church, the fellowship um, of the local church. It was also in that time of my life that I was given um, the Book of Common Prayer from the Episcopal Church, and I learned to love those prayers and morning prayer service and many of the Anglican hymns. So when I married Tom in 1965, uh, I was ready to become an Episcopalian. Um, I didn't just follow him into that. He had become an Anglican in England a few years before, but I was quite ready to do that. And it was um, as Episcopalians that we raised our children um, in the liturgy and the Christian year, all of which became very important and wonderful to me. Um, it, well, it was during that time, too, that, um, that Tom read his way into the Catholic Church. How long was that after your, your marriage? Um, that I became... So that he became Catholic. Oh, that we had been married 19 years okay. when it began to surface and right. break through. Mm -hmm. So you, and you were Episcopalian for most of those nine years, so that was really the gist of your... Of yeah, your well, I life became an Episcopalian right within the first two or three years of okay. our marriage. Okay, yeah. okay. so yeah. you were both Episcopalian mm -hmm. lived and lived... And raised our life, children. Raised your mm -hmm. children Episcopalian, yeah. yes. and then he, he becomes Catholic. Well, how was your response to his decision to become well, Catholic? Well, I had two responses. First of all, I, I, I understood... I was sympathetic. I, I thought he was right, but I was terrified because I wasn't there. Um, I couldn't just do it to follow him. We hadn't lived our life that way. We were too old for that. <laughs> and um, I, so I was really anxious that our, we not have this division and separation in our life of too many friends I knew whose husbands, say, weren't Christians, and they were, had a big separation of this important place in their life. I was really 
scared. Um, we'd been married 19 years at this point, and during that summer, Tom was away quite a bit. And I had lots of time to pray and pour out my heart to God about this. And there was one day that I was praying, and I felt that God put a choice before me. I could either dig in my heels and cling to my fear and live out the whole division that I could see ahead, or I could receive this from God, um, and that this is the way God would answer my prayers for my husband. Um, every wife prays for her husband. I think that's partly what we're for. <laughs> and I did have some things I was looking to God to do, and I chose that way. I mean, it, it chose itself for me, with grace. and with a lot of peace. Um, and then Tom and I spent the next six months talking and talking and talking. We left no stone unturned. Sometimes we went too far and wish we could draw back and hadn't said that, but <laughs> we talked it all through. One day he said to me with tears in his eyes, I can't bear the thought of being in a different communion from my wife. And that touched my heart deeply to know that there was no antagonism between us about it, but it was still scary. And one Sunday afternoon after one of these conversations, I went up to my room and I sat down at my desk and I realized that I wanted Tom to be able to do this with freedom and with joy and that he couldn't until I was happy and at peace about it. And again, God gave me the peace. It was a wonderful work of grace. And I went downstairs and was able to say that he had my blessing, as it were, to do this. And we never had a moment's um, trouble about it. It was an amazing and wonderful experience. You know, I remember when, when his conversion oh, yeah. happened, mm -hmm. because I remember reading about it in, oh, yes. in at least one major yeah. Uh, evangelical magazine, and uh, they didn't treat him with very gently. It was a hard time for Tom. So many of the rest of us have come along, you know, with cheering from yeah. the sidelines, but it was scary for him. He yeah. was going out alone, and he didn't have many people before him. He was a professor? He was. At the time? Yes. I, I forgot, did he lose his professorship as well, a result? Or? Um, he had to leave, yeah. let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. Um, and we're still friends with all those right. friends, but it was a trying and frightening time for him. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing I could be with him, yeah. even though I couldn't do it at the same time. And then, okay, so you've, you've by the leading of God and His grace, uh, you, you give Tom yes, the, the freedom. Yes, that's right. Well, now there's 10 years. Right. Well, so we, how did you deal with the 10 years? Well, we had eight wonderful years of an ecumenical home. Um, Whenever we went out of town together, I went with him to the Catholic Church because I was looking and wanting to learn. I wasn't against it. I just <laughs> couldn't do it yet. Um, and then I went in once a week with him to St. John's Seminary where he began to teach English. And I had an office in which I prepared the Bible study that I led at my Episcopal Church. And I got to know the priests there, and they were wonderful friends to me. Um, we also made friends with um, a group of Carmelite nuns who lived near us, and that was a wonderful help to me. I think in those eight years, I began to get to know the Catholic Church and Catholic Christians. I just hadn't known any. I hadn't known bad Catholics. I just hadn't known any Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that was what was happening. I was reading St. Francis de Sales was the mentor I had always longed for, and Romano Guardini I read. Um, and we knocked along for about eight years that way. In a sense of being very comfortable learning. We were. But not really being driven I, to no, decide. No, no. Always, um, I was loved and befriended is what I would say was going on in those eight years. All right. Well, what was the, finally the, the last straw? Something does. That well. <laughs> that opened your heart to the Catholic Church. Right. Um, well, about two years before I was received, we ran into difficulties in my Episcopal Church. And it was during that experience that I think the big watershed came. And basically what it was, was I saw myself for the first time with what, just for a short language, I would call it my Protestant attitude, by which I mean I thought every issue had to come across my desk and be submitted to my judgment whether it was what we should do or how we should do it or what we should think or say or believe. And I, I saw that I had lived my whole life 
thinking I had to decide everything. Not so much moral issues, but procedural or doctrinal. And as though I was just one of many, many, many who had to make these decisions. But it was unconscious, but it was very definite. And when I saw this through the troubles that we went through there, I was horrified. I didn't like the look of it, and it didn't make sense. And looking back, I think it was that revelation of my own attitude that kind of cracked open my um, prejudice against the Catholic Church, that opened my mind. My heart hadn't been so closed, but my mind had been closed. And I sort of stepped aside and was open to receive and at least listen to the teaching of the church because it was the teaching of the church. And for me, once that happened, everything else began to open up. Um, maybe another thing that was part of that, but was distinct, was beginning, therefore, to learn what the Catholic Church really teaches. Yeah. Yeah. How did I know? I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and at this time, also, the Catechism of the Catholic Church came out, and I was thrilled to death. I started at the beginning, and I read to the end. <laughs> when I got through, I went back with a pen, and I did it again, and I loved it. And mm -hmm. my reaction to the Catechism was not so much, oh, I've been wrong, the Catholic Church was right, but on the basic doctrines that good evangelicals like yeah. me and the Catholic Church share um, on justification and sanctification and these things, I, I read it and I thought, but this is what I believe. This is what I've always believed. And I was so thrilled. And the scripture, I mean, the catechism just takes the scripture and opens it up. There's more scripture in the catechism than anything I've ever read. And I thought there were verses that only us evangelicals knew. I thought they were my private property. And I saw the Catholic Church had got there before I How had. dare the Catholic yeah. Church <laughs> say John 3, 6, <laughs> that's ours. <laughs> but they, they, and my good Paul, I mean, I, but the letters of Paul were my speciality. And well, they were all over the catechism. And it was a very thrilling experience to me. Um, and then in that time, those last two years, I went to Tom and I said, what are those books by Cardinal Newman that you're always talking about? And I read The Development of Christian Doctrine and his Apologia. Um, and that answered so many questions for me. It just opened my eyes. And Carl Adams' Spirit of Catholicism, which at the time for me dealt with every question I had very satisfactorily. So the only other thing I would add to that is uh, um, the Spirit of God was at work in my heart and my mind, and it was time. It felt like time, but I think it was God's doings. In the, the scriptural account of, of Paul's conversion, you know, he's zapped, yeah. <laughs> and then the scales fall away, yes. right? In, in a sense, you described your scales falling yes. away as this yes. particular attitude. I want you to talk more about that attitude. Uh, describe it in more detail, because I, I really want the audience to hear and identify that, because I, re I related to that. You did. Very strong. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I think um, because we were given the Bible, and the Bible only, and the Holy Spirit, I grew up thinking that all anything took was the Bible and the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and me. Mm -hmm. And I was led to identify always with St. Paul himself. It didn't dawn on me that he was sort of the chief of apostles back there and that I was just me much, much <laughs> later. There, and it wasn't really a, um, a, an arrogance that that is too blameworthy. It was so unconscious. It was so yes. earnest. Yes. It was so responsible. Mm -hmm. It was so jump in there and give it everything you've got. But every single verse was... I, I remember as a missionary in Japan for the first time thinking, I don't know if I do want everybody to go off to Bible school and seminary and become clergy. We need some people in the pews. <laughs> Till then I thought we were all supposed to be St. Paul. But it did mean that we were all passing judgment on everything. And we had no one to look to. We didn't even have bishops in our church. I think when I was in this mission in Japan, I experienced the, the ministry of bishops because it was a very hierarchical setup. It was before the 60s, really. And um, you did have godly men over you, and decisions were made in council, and you lived by them. I did experience that. But that was the first time I'd ever run into that. The idea that there was, that the buck stopped somewhere, and that um, 
the teaching authority of the church. I had never heard of it, but it, it, it created chaos in our local situation. <laughs> I said that I related so much to that. and Because the danger is that when we're blind to how much our presuppositions shape our interpretation of Scripture, yes. and then therefore how we judge others' interpretation yes. of Scripture, uh, when we're blind to that, we can buy into some bad theology. I think yes. about those that take that Isaiah passage that says, by his stripes we are healed, or take a Matthew passage that says, whatever you ask in my name yes. I will give. Yes. You throw it together, and you end up with a health, wealth, gospel. Yes. If I'm a Christian, yes. I should be healthy and wealthy. And you look at those verses, and someone says, that's true, and makes that judgment. Mm -hmm. And you add to that someone who's a charismatic personality, right. and you have a new church, a that's new right. movement. That's right. And it reminds me of that passage in Romans also, where, where I know I've mentioned this on the program before, where uh, Paul says, how will they hear unless someone preaches? How will they preach unless they're sent? You were sent to Japan as a missionary, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by a missionary board mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. authority. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then again, who had their authority? Mm -hmm. Who To whom were they responsible right. to make sure what they were teaching was true? And this this uh, individual that's judgment. Right. That's right. And it makes you very responsible. That's mm -hmm. that's a good thing. But it, I, I began to see the weaknesses in it. Another point of your yeah. journey was the catechism. Oh, the catechism was indeed. The catechism is a glorious book. Um, I'll let you do an advertisement. For yeah, it. Well, it's, it's hard not to. people to read it. Yeah, it's not just little questions and short answers. It's a beautiful opening up of all the glorious teaching. Yeah of the church, of the faith, of the scripture. Uh, but it's so organized that you can relate this part to that part, and you can find help on a particular topic. But it's not, they're not so isolated from each other. I do think it needs to be read in sections, at, at least once or twice in your life, so that when you go to look up one thing, you see it in relation. But the, the, the whole beautiful context in which everything is put of our calling to know God and share his life. I mean, I had looked to that forever. Yeah, if anyone has any questions <laughs> about what the Catholic Church truly teaches, yes. look in the catechism. Yes. And, uh, well, and not just doctrine. There's a beautiful oh, section on prayer. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and, and on the moral issues, too. I, I found it wonderfully kind. And, mm -hmm. it, and it did something I'd longed for all my life where it stood fast on moral teaching, but with a lack of uh, personal judgment on an individual. I didn't have to decide on another sheep, but I didn't have to give up the standard either, and I had struggled for that all my life, and there it is. That's right. Another thing that helped me a lot was um, crossing the threshold of hope when the Holy Father's book came out. Again, I found that standing fast for the doctrine, but with a gracious and humble attitude toward other people. Servant of servants. Yes. yes, and not having to be rude and harsh with people who disagree with you in order to defend your faith. Yeah. Um, I had longed for that, and here it all was in the Catholic Church, believe it or not. <laughs> you mentioned also the witness of other Catholics. Yes, I had never come across um, these wonderful Catholic families uh, who my husband had young men from families of 10 and 12 kids. And, and the devotion and the spiritual life in those families and the faith of these young men, I had never met these people before. Um, I met wonderful Christians at Franciscan University, Steubenville, wonderful Catholic Christians. Um, and our Carmelite nuns were the most fun people we'd ever known. I told my daughter when she was going to college, yes, you may go to your Ivy League school, but you've got to meet these women first. <laughs> you've got to see intelligence and holiness and good humor before your eyes. Um, and they have been wonderful friends. And through time, also, uh, because of the circle of friends mm -hmm. that he was developing, you met some leaders in the church who were men we could well, really follow. Yes, Cardinal Law, I think, came to Boston just before Tom's conversion and was, he's only two or three years older than we are, but he was a fatherly pastor to Tom. And I, I along with many other non-Catholic Christians in Boston, looked to him for leadership mm -hmm. on big issues and, and moral questions. And that's a big drawing card to the church. Now, as you described your journey, uh, you didn't mention Mary. Mary's a big uh, stumbling block for a lot of people on the journey. Well, I 
had a wonderful experience of Mary, but I think that is an example also of how once my mind was open to the teaching of the church, I could accept what the church taught about Mary before I fully understood it. Mm. I didn't have to worry it through and get it all figured out. Tom uses the term of reinventing the wheel yeah. all the time, and that was really me. I was really into that. Yeah. But um, I went to my um, Anglican priest, an Anglo-Catholic priest, before I became a Catholic, to teach me to learn, a Catholic, learn to live a Catholic life. And when I walked in his office the first time, I didn't have a clue about the Virgin Mary. And while he was talking, it's just, again, the scales falling off my eyes. And I knew she was there for me, the mother. Um, and I walked out of that office with my feet three inches up off the <laughs> <laughs> sidewalk. I had been praying the rosary for quite a while. I don't remember when I started praying the rosary, but that's been very, very important to me. I feel that I pray my prayers with her, in fellowship with her, um, and it's made a wonderful difference to Explain me. a little bit about the rosary. Uh, assuming that someone's watching that has the foggiest idea what the rosary is all about. You mean the technical Ta way it works? about why about it as a, as a prayer, how you well, found it helpful. Well, what helped me about the Rosary was Romano Guardini's little book, The Rosary of Our Lady. And he, he does it in what I think is the German way, because I've also found it in German missals. Um, and he taught me in his book with each, each line to pray um, the mystery, like instead of just saying um, um, the Annunciation. Yeah. You pray, Hail Mary, full of uh, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, whom thou, O Virgin, hast conceived by the Holy okay. Ghost. And you do that every time. Mm -hmm. It gives you longer to meditate and to, to focus. stay there. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I took to that. <laughs> and I found, well, I find the rosary wonderful from two different angles. For praying for my own children, my family, who I know a lot about, and I could just pray on and on and on and on <laughs> indefinitely. About it. it keeps me focused and it keeps me moving. And as I pray through the different mysteries on the different days, there are different emphases that come. And then I find it wonderful to pray for people that I'm committed to pray for, but I don't know what's going on. And I'm able to lift them up with the Blessed Mother in this. I pray my rosary in an intercess intercessory way. Um, it's just something God yeah. led me into. It's nothing official, but um, that's how I pray my prayers. And it has, for an intense person like me, it has been a wonderful <laughs> relief yeah. just to lift it all up with her. The other reason that I had wanted you in the program, because we did have Tom, mm -hmm. was because, as you also know in the work that I do, and also you and Tom help many on their mm -hmm. journey, towards and into the Catholic Church is that it, uh, it's about 80% of the time one spouse is one or two or three or a dozen steps ahead of the mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. on their way in. And sometimes that causes great yes, turmoil it does. in. Um, and sometimes there's confusion out of what kind of advice you give to these to these people. And talk a little bit from your own experience about that struggle between the husband and wife on the journey. But mainly, you mean us? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what happened for Tom and me was we'd been married between 19 and 20 years. And the joy of it for us was the revelation that during those years we had developed a love and a trust and a respect. I'm not just throwing those words out. They, that's what it was that took us through this. Um, my own I suspicion is that some of the troubles that spouses have over this is that they've got marital problems and instability, let's say. But I think it can be good. It can bring to the surface things that need, need to be worked on. So um, Tom gets a lot of calls from people yes. about these things, and sometimes we get to know the couples together. And I also find that wives' concerns are sometimes very different from the husbands, perhaps not so doctrinal, not so ecclesiastical. They're concerned about their children, they're concerned about their friends, they're concerned about the local parish. Yeah. And um, those, sometimes that needs a little bit of woman-to-woman -woman work in there. And that's, that's why, for example, in the work of the Coming Home Network, we're linking people up yes, who've yes. been through similar 
journeys mm -hmm. so they can relate. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. one last question before we take a break. Um, there's quite a bit of difference in uh, just the way that an evangelical worships uh, in, in their relationship with Christ compared to ours as Catholic. And I think in, in that sense, many evangelicals wonder whether, on the one hand, we Catholics or converts to the Catholic Church have mm -hmm. given up an intimacy with Christ oh. for a dry, liturgical, uh, mm -hmm. you know, more institutionalized. Mm -hmm. how, was you, how were you in that transition? Well, of course, I did that in the Episcopal Church. Okay. I really learned to love and embrace liturgical worship and to push my children into it while trying to keep them in the evangelical songs and stories and things as well. Um, so that had already happened to me, but there is something to be said, even if you have a very intimate and immediate relationship with Jesus Christ from your evangelical past, there's something to be said for the objectivity of not just the liturgical, but the sacramental yeah. life. And I, I feel like I'm just beginning to get mm -hmm. hold of that myself. Yeah, yeah I, I, we talked about this many times in this program, that, that little prayer, I believe, but help my unbelief. Yes. You know, it's a journey of us understanding yes, yes. the sacraments and their place and yes. their, the channels of grace that come through there. But it isn't a sacrificing of the intimacy. Not for me it hasn't been. No. Not at all. And um, the rosary is part of that yeah. intimacy That's right. to me. And, and the Liturgy of the Hours, um, it helps me with my prayer. Well, maybe we'll have questions about some okay. of those things we mentioned. But let's take a little break. Encourage you to call uh, if you have any questions for us. Again, the number is 1 800 221 9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest for this evening is Loveless Howard, the wife of Tom Howard, who was my first guest on the program, <laughs> oh, about 100 programs ago. And she's been talking to us about your journey uh, for a time watching Tom yes. become a Catholic, go through the struggles there, and then live as a Catholic for eight years while you were still living as an Anglican. And then you had your awakening, which was this recognition of um, prejudice, yeah. a way of putting it, yeah. uh, but also kind of the way Newman says when he makes a comment, uh, every church must have its pope. <laughs> well, we were our own pope. Yes, that was it. That's a good way to put it. You know, we were, we, everything truly, because what happens is that, and this happens all the time, I know it does because as a Protestant minister, we had forms to take care of this when uh, parishioners were always changing from one church to the next every yes. week it seemed and what were they doing they were standing up as the dis final that's right arbiter of what was true and it's we so embarrassing when you finally when see you it realize, <laughs> when, oh it is it really is it's, it is embarrassing before we go to, the, to our first email though i wanted to bring up you'd mentioned the uh, liturgy of the hours yes and you'd also mentioned earlier that part of your journey from evangelicalism was going to the Book of Common Prayer, which is the Ang Anglican, Anglican. Uh, official Book of Prayer. Liturgy of Hours is the, is the Catholic mm -hmm. Book of Prayer. Mm -hmm. But I also, with that, remember your husband's book, Evangelical is Not Enough, talking about liturgical prayer yeah. uh, and the distinctness of that. Talk a little bit more about it. Well, I learned these. way back when with the Book of Common Prayer to love those prayers, yeah. but it wasn't either or. It wasn't instead yeah. of pouring my own heart out to God. Right. That's never been a problem to me because I didn't think that set prayers meant I couldn't pray another way. Um, and I, I do get amused sometimes that um, as the 
evangelicals are beginning more and more to read prayers, and the Catholic priests are beginning more and more to pray extemporaneously. <laughs> I yeah. notice that all the time. But so it's not either or. That's one thing. And I learned that yeah. on my own. Um, and I love the Book of Common Prayer. I did become an Episcopalian with the new Book of Common Prayer. I was sort of a right to Episcopalian, yeah. not really an Anglo-Catholic myself, yeah. um, though Tom was. Not for long, I wasn't. But um, but I, I do love the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, it, it's a very confusing book when you first look at yeah. it. And we had the, learn the Christian it, yeah. prayer, the little the bit one shorter volume, one. Yeah. Yes, and I, and I said to my um, confessor when I, early on in my Catholic life, oh, I can't make head or tails out of the Liturgy of the Hours. He said, yes, you can. Just start with morning and evening prayer. And with that encouragement, I went home and I did that uh -huh. and gradually got a grip on it. And um, another little thing about that is for any Anglican, sort of giving up your Anglican hymns when you become a Roman Catholic is probably the hardest thing of all. But I discovered more wonderful hymns since I've become a Catholic because I, there are hymns all through the Liturgy of the Hours. And I took my old 1940 Episcopal hymn book and got tunes for the ones I didn't know. And I learned that hymn book like I had never known it before. So there's a lot you can do by yourself. It's, I it's discovered in becoming Catholic that my favorite hymn which is Be Thou My Vision, was in fact a Catholic yeah. Irish hymn from about the 8th century. Isn't you know, that I wonderful? Just, I love that. Yeah. The, uh, what's in Liturgy of the Hours it's, is the official prayer of the church. Every priest, yes. religious, must pray it. So when we as laity yes. are invited to pray, we're praying the same prayers that other Catholics are praying all around the world. Yes. And there's a, w at least one place in the Liturgy of the Hours where it says personal prayer. Yes. So it encourages you with Absolutely. the liturgical is to pour your heart out uh, with all your needs and petitions. Yep. So it's a both and. Yeah, it isn't exactly. merely a, a yeah, but there are many times when you don't know what words to use if, right. if things are too difficult That's or right. too huge, and then there it is for you. Let's take our first email for this evening. This is from Bill. Mrs. Howard. Have any of your children followed you and your husband into the Catholic Church? Well, I have only two children. <laughs> so one has and one hasn't yet. Um, our daughter they, was received a year and a half ago. Um, and I wouldn't even say it was just following us. Okay. She did her own thing. She's a grown woman. And, um, that, but that gave us great joy. And one thing that's wonderful about the church is it's very big. And she doesn't, in becoming a Catholic, she doesn't have to be right here just like us. She can be a little bit over here, perhaps. So it gives us a lot of freedom to move about mm -hmm. within the church. Was she, did she come from the Episcopalianism into the Catholic? Yes, our children were brought up. They love oh, the liturgy. Right. Yes, they were brought up Episcopalians. And um, they really don't know anything else. Right. <laughs> okay, let's take our first caller. This is Rodney from Nebraska. Hello, Rodney. What's your question for us tonight? Hi. In uh, John... 14 verse 6 Jesus said I am the way and the truth and the life yeah. no one comes to the Father except through me then Paul writing to Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy 2 5 says for there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus in view of that how can you pray the rosary using Mary and the saints as mediators when Jesus said he's the only way to the Father and that he is the only mediator? Thank you, Rodney, for your question. Well, I've never run into a Catholic pre priest or teacher who said anything else but what we've just heard read from the scriptures. Right. And I would describe um, my praying of the rosary as praying in fellowship with the Blessed Mother just like all my life I have prayed in fellowship with other friends who've asked me to pray for them. But I feel that she, of course, is in a different category and very close there to, to pray. And her prayers are wonderful. And she has a motherly understanding of our needs that I could never attain to on my own. So it doesn't feel like an either-or thing at all to me. The, and Rodney, I presume you're a Christian. I know that by your quoting of Scripture. And I believe by your question that you hold Scripture very highly. 
Well, that you have to interpret Scripture in the light of all of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. And you know that there are a number of Scriptures where Paul asks others to pray for him. As he says, he is praying for others. Uh, in all of his letters, at least one of those, or if not both, are asked, pray mm -hmm. for me, I'll pray for you. So we know that he is interceding for others, and he's asking others to intercede. So right there, they're being mediators for each other to God. So just in that sense, not even talking about the rosary or yeah. the communion of saints, we would see a contradiction in Scripture if that's exactly and only what the mediatorship of Christ meant. Um, to get back from the rosary to Mary yeah. gets back to and also an understanding of what we believe by the communion of saints, that these people are not dead, they're alive in Christ. And just as we can intercede for them, mm -hmm. they can intercede for us. That's what our prayers are doing. We're not worshiping them, we're not praying to them in the same the way that we pray, for, pray to Christ, who we can pray for, pray to it. Exactly. Yes. But it's, it's asking them to stand beside us as we stand beside each exactly. other. And that's, ex that's really all that it is. Uh, let's take our next email. This, uh, dear Marcus and Loveless, I am an Episcopalian and I'm drawn to many things about the Catholic Church and sometimes pray the rosary. However, it seems the focal point of this prayer is more upon Mary than Jesus. And this is a concern to me. Thank you for your response. Well, going through the mysteries, um, it seems like it's more on Jesus than Mary to me. <laughs> um, it's the most wonderful way to meditate on the facts of the gospel. Um, and that has been the blessing of it to me, to have all of my prayers, all of my concerns for those I love and pray for, um, just taken up into the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Um, there, and even as an evangelical Protestant, um, Mary's part in the life of Jesus was very precious to me, very wonderful. And that doesn't feel strange or new or different to me at all. And, and then the, glor the glorious mysteries um, are these are all just basic Christian doctrines. We need maybe for those that aren't familiar with yes, the Yes, and I know mysteries. I can't just there's, there's, recite them all. Right, I'm trying to probably one yeah. line with you <laughs> together. So there's maybe the Annunciation, we can. Mm -hmm. the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, the birth of Jesus mm -hmm. in the manger. There's his uh, the offering in the temple. Offering when he's presented mm -hmm. as a, a baby, and then the finding him. Finding him. Yes. And so in all those cases, of course, there's Mary involved, but there's also Elizabeth. There's Joseph, the angel. There's Jesus. Yeah. Shepherds are all involved. And then in the uh, Sorrowful Mysteries, you have the agony in the garden, praying at Gethsemane. Second of all, you have his scourging. Yes. Thirdly, crowning, crowning of thorns. thorns. Then you have carrying his own cross, and then his crucifixion. So very Christ-centered. Uh, absolutely. Focusing us on his sacrifice for us. And then the Glorious Mysteries are his ascension into the heaven. The resurrection. The resurrection, yeah. yes, the resurrection. The, the ascension. ascension. The coming of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. the annunci the mm -hmm. as uh, ascension, as assumption. assumption. <laughs> How long have we been Catholics? I don't know. <laughs> the assumption of Mary and his and her crown. coronation yeah. as Queen of yeah. Heaven, yeah. Queen of. In one Lord. sense, those are the only two that are extra right. biblical and just about Mary. The rest, it's the life of Christ all the way through. That's right, mm -hmm. and so they draw us into the gospel message. Absolutely, and they're also a challenge to us. And I, I have found that most people who have so many uh, complaints or criticisms of the rosary, it, because, it comes because a couple things. One, they bring to it presuppositions about all kinds of strange ideas mm -hmm. of what Catholics mm -hmm. do in the rosary, and they right. have not taken the time to understand what the Catholics truly believe about the rosary and what goes on. The second thing is, is that as a Protestant, we watched Catholics pray the rosary and we don't understand what That's they're right. doing. That's right. Holding these beads, or as Belloc would say, saying these beads before a statue. And again, it's information. It's learning, whether you accept it or not, learn the truth about what happens and what Catholics right. are praying. Right. Let's take this next caller. This is Sheila from Rhode Island. Hello, Sheila. What's your question for us? Hello, um, and hello, Mrs. Howard. Hello. What <laughs> I would like to know and I'm wondering about is 
now that you're a member of the Roman Catholic Church, a church which believes uh, they are the one true faith, how do you feel about those Episcopalians <laughs> who will not take your journey and who also believe that their faith is just as true as yours? Um, did you ask me what I think about or what I feel about? Um, that's um, one of my friends who is a convert from the Episcopal Church said to me years ago, when you've been an Episcopalian and you become a Roman Catholic, the Episcopal Church is like your hometown. You don't want to move back, but it's where you grew up. It's your hometown. And I have to say that that is very true for me. I'm still wonderfully close to my um, Episcopal friends. And that is, in a sense, home in the way Birmingham is home to me. And I don't sit myself in judgment on their move that they sh should or shouldn't make. That is, I feel I've been released from having to stand over them in that kind of judgment. I know their living faith. I know they love the Lord. And they are my friends. And they love me. Um, when my mother died, it was the Episcopal Church I spent 25 years in that I called to, to tell my friends about it and who prayed for me and wrote to me, as did my Catholic Church. But these were still my friends. So um, I don't feel that I have to make a judgment on that. And the church doesn't call us to. No. That's a wonderful release for me. The church does me. not call us to do mm -hmm. that. The church doesn't. You know, when, it, when the church teaches about it being the true church, when you read the catechism and understand what the church means by that, it, it's, not, it's, it's not that arrogant as it may no, sound. It's, no. That's not what the meaning is. It's basically recognizing the responsibility that the church has been given as the continuing church established on the apostles, led by the Holy Spirit to lead them into all truth so that they could protect the deposit of faith that Christ gave to his apostles. Mm -hmm. And that's... That's the calling of the church from the beginning. And it was called from the beginning in those favorite passages from John 13 right, through 17 right, that you right. love so much even mm -hmm. as an evangelical, that there would be one church. And the church believes that that's what it has done and carried mm -hmm. out throughout its, its existence. It wishes that there weren't the 20,000 plus mm -hmm. separated groups in the world, but that's th the sad reality of the way that it is. I think one of the things that has that I've loved about being a Catholic is that I can have that vision of one church, but I don't then have to go make this judgment on my individual friends. I, I could never see that before. Yeah, yeah. We believe in the mercy of God. And it's, Our it's, desire, even with this program, is not to stand in judgment of anyone, but to proclaim the joy of the fullness right. of the revelation of God in the Catholic Church. It, it, it's, it's why we are here and right. why we've made this, this journey. Let's take this next email. It's from Monica Roca. Hi, I'm in eighth grade studying the communion of saints, and I was wondering if the souls in purgatory can ask God to make their time in purgatory longer for the sins of a person on earth. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know we can pray for them, but can they do anything for us? Well, I haven't just had that catechism bit at the tip of my fingers, to tell oh, you the truth. Oh, boy, and I don't know what I can say to you, Monica, either on this one. I'll have to grab one of these priests here during a break or something. More <laughs> specific. I was wondering if the souls in purgatory could ask God to make their time in purgatory longer for the sins of a person on earth. I don't know I if don't we can give an answer to that. I know that we should pray for those who are still going through their purification. In other words, who are on the journey. They're going to be in heaven, and they're in that opening door. But before they enter into God's presence, as it says, they are to be perfect without embarrassment. We read in First John. Wonderful. So there's a time there when they're going through that cleansing process. We don't know how long it is. So, but we can pray for them. For them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is I, this is maybe a speculative one. So I don't know, Monica. You may have to ask or someone to read in the uh, even in, in one way or another. It's going to be speculative. Maybe Saint Thomas has said something about it. <laughs> Let's see, we had a, uh, uh, I, let's see, I've got a message from the, the experts in the back room. They, they can pray for us, but not for themselves. Not clear if they can, thank you for the experts just gave me a, <laughs> a, 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 helped us out here. Let's take our next caller, John from Pennsylvania. Hello, John. Hello, Marcus, and hello, Loveless. <clears throat> Good to uh, speak with you this evening. I uh, also am a convert from the Episcopal Church, and uh, 
C.S. Lewis was very important to a friend of mine, Sheldon Van Auken. Mm -hmm. And Van Auken, as you know, was a convert to the church. And going through some of his letters over a 30-year period, he often talked how important Thomas Howard and Peter Kraft were in his journey. And I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on your friendship with Van Auken and how that all played out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. What was Sheldon's book's name? Do you remember his a name? Severe of Mercy. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, I only met him once. He and Tom and Peter were great buddies and corresponded, though they didn't meet too often. But um, Sheldon Van Auken did come to visit us one time, and my memory of it mainly is this great big man getting out of this tiny little car. <laughs> and I, um, that was really a friendship of Tom's. It was very much a man's world yeah. there. And so I really couldn't s say too much on that. Peter Kraft has been a wonderful friend of ours. Um, and Peter, again, never put any pressure on Tom to become a Catholic. In fact, when Tom told him he was about to do it, Peter sort of took him aside and said, now, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> so he's, he's a, been a, a wonderful friend. Peter Kraft, who's a professor at Boston College, yes, was a yes. convert from the Christian Reformed Church. Yes, and way back, yes. long before, before us. Yeah, it, it's interesting when you hear about these stories of Tom Howard and Peter Kraft and Sheldon Von Ocker, it reminds me of, of older connections of converts like Chesterton yes, and yes. Uh, Evelyn Waugh and some of these mm -hmm. great literary writers uh, and the influence. Then, of course, you have C.S. Lewis and, and uh, Tolkien and these mm -hmm. different groups of uh, very influential writers who walk the spiritual journeys together. Mm -hmm. We don't always know about their intimacies. We see it played out in their, in their writings. Mm -hmm. But they had great influence on their own journeys of faith. That's right. Let's take this next email. Um, Marcus and Loveless, thank you for the program and your inspiring testimonies. Many, if not most, cradle Catholics like myself seem to not give priority to our spiritual lives. While many Journey Home guests have had deep spiritual lives even before your conversions, can you offer suggestions for helping us to not take our faith for granted, but rather to put God first in our lives? Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That is quite wonderful. Um, well, let's see. I, one of the things that I think is good is praying the Liturgy of the Hours it, and um, getting familiar with the Scriptures. I think it is the familiarity and praying of the Scripture that did contribute to the vibrant spiritual life of so many evangelicals. Uh, but it's all there in the Catholic scene as well. Um, there's nothing better than the prayers of the Liturgy of the Hours. I happen to love the new little Magnificat that has come out, which is very simple, doesn't take too long. Any lay person can do it morning and evening. But it's directed and it puts your day focused in God. Um, then there are writers like St. Francis de Sales who has, have helped me just beyond measure, who take the doctrines of the Church and the creeds, but relate it to the affairs of everyday lay life. It's all there in the Catholic Church. It's there in the bookstores, on the bookshelves of Catholic bookstores. And it's available to people today in a way that perhaps it never has been before. That's so true. And I know we've said many times in this program that if one of the babies thrown out with the bathwater of the Re Reformation was the great spiritual heritage of mm -hmm, the church. Mm -hmm. It's not that Protestants don't have that. that that's mm -hmm. not what I mean. But each individual Protestant group had to start from scratch. Yes. So they decided to start from scratch. They would start with the Bible, read the scriptures, put scriptures together that would lead them into a spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And that was, would be fine, but it would take them just so far. Then another group would do the same, another group would do the same. There was an author not maybe 10 years ago, they wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline. Yes. With a whole book on yeah. the traditional disciplines of, the, of Christianity as if he had just discovered, discovered something. Them. Well, becoming a Catholic, I realized these have been with us all along. And what we see then in the Catholic Church is the beauty of the, the reflection and the meditation, the development of men like St. John of the Cross or mm -hmm. Teresa of Avila, mm -hmm. uh, who live these disciplines. And now the number of books that are available to it's help wonderful. us grow spiritually. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it all comes back to the same thing. It's surrendering to Jesus Christ and you know, responding to God's grace 
inviting the Holy Spirit to lead us and to open us. But let me ask you this. I heard about detachment a whole lot more as a Catholic than I ever did before. Did you find that true, this whole spirituality of detachment? I did at a time, but I haven't. It just hasn't been a big okay. thing for me. Um, it's something that has struck me so much in this idea, again, of rec it was in evangelicalism. Yeah. But the recognizing that we have to turn away from ourselves. Yes, yes. I, I, the particular word I yes. hadn't followed. The detachment yes. was a word that, that it's it, the, is a Catholic word. Right, exactly. We didn't use it very much evangelicalism, right. but it meant recognizing that everything in this world is, is merely right. uh, a fleeting and that we need to be detached from it so that we can be totally sold out. I think that's why I'm always um, talking about St. Francis de Sales, because he takes that kind of thing and he teaches lay people how to live that way, always with your eyes on the Lord instead of on yourself. He, he corresponded with so many lay people, lay women particularly, and then he had all of these wonderful, intensely spiritual nuns to keep <laughs> sort of balanced as well. So he, he just got it in a wonderful way. And his books and excerpts from his bigger, heavier things are available in the yes. last few years as they never have been before. Yeah. Well, and the introduction to devout life. It's the best thing tremendous. that I ever read. Yeah. It really was wonderfully helpful. But I'd also me. recommend the of course, the whole catechism, but the last section on prayer yes, is it's extremely good. It's so unlike your usual collections of That's right. what we must do or believe. It is very intimate. It is great instruction as an induction to Catholic understanding of spirituality. And it's all right there, especially um, calling us to see our heart as a, a place of uh, growing in perfection mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and a place for the indwelling of the Spirit to change us into the people God wants us to mm -hmm. be. You know, it's been a real joy having you with us. Thank you. you know, time sure flies when you. you're having fun, isn't it? <laughs> How about some closing thoughts um, for wives on the journey from your own experience? On the journey to the church? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think honesty is very, very important. Listening to God, waiting for Him. Um, if your husband's ahead of you, I, I, I think honesty with each other and a humility, uh, a love and a patience and a grace with each other. I should think that um, going through this could revitalize a person's marriage if they did it right. And with prayer and openness and, a, and an opportunity to discover what it really is that's holding us yeah. back. Uh. Sometimes it's not the obvious things, perhaps, and to to discover old things that perhaps are blocking the way, and we think it's something else. Yeah. Um, and then to to those who have somebody else doing it, I would just call for for love. I feel I was loved into the church, <laughs> and that's the only way that could have worked for me. That's right. I needed. You mentioned time. all those friends, those oh, Catholics. Yes. You know, I, I've often said that the three things that hold people back from becoming Catholics are ignorance, prejudice, and bad Catholics. Oh. <laughs> and what I mean by bad Catholics is not necessarily that they're bad Catholics, no. but from the standpoint of those on the outside who don't understand, sometimes Catholics look like they're not even Christians yes. from the outside. It's because we don't know, we don't understand. That's right. But in your case, as you mentioned, those, those Catholic friends they helped you understand through their lives they did. What, what a true Catholic is. They did. And it partly had to do with receiving me as a Christian, too. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was real love and grace. And that's a good encouraging word for all of us, uh, not just with our friends outside the church, mm -hmm. but with our family members that have, have drifted a bit or don't understand the faith that they were brought up with. Um, uh, to not stand in judgment to recognize that it sometimes can look real confusing mm -hmm. out there. And a lot of prayer. That's I right. think our, our Carmelite nuns prayed <laughs> us in. <laughs> I think they did. Mm -hmm. well, Loveless, thank you so much. Well, it's been good it's, to be here. Finally got you here. <laughs> thank you for having was, me and for your patience. <laughs> well, it was, it was a great pleasure to have <laughs> yes, you with us. Yes, I appreciate it. I also thank you for joining us on the journey home. Uh, all right, I've got one of the wives here, <laughs> and hopefully in the weeks ahead we'll hear both sides of the journey because as Loveless shared with us, there's joys and struggles on the journey, but they were strengthened by the witness of the Catholics in her life 
that helped them understand that Catholics are true Christians, That's right. followers of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. Let's keep one another in prayer, and I'll see you again next week. God bless.